Oggigiorno, effettuare plusvalenze all'interno dell'atto di compravendita di giocatori è un meccanismo ormai assodato, soprattutto se la mano invisibile che governa i trasferimenti si chiama capitalismo. Bisogna obbligatoriamente sottolineare il lato oscuro del sogno di questi giovani atleti, i quali, senza accorgersene, sono man mano diventati oggetti, spogliandosi totalmente della loro componente umana. Inoltre, questi sportivi non solo sono costretti a vivere sulla loro pelle il cambiamento socio-economico del calciomercato, bensì devono prevenire eventuali sfruttamenti di sedicenti agenti che facendo leva sulle loro irrazionalità provocano sofferenza, umiliazione e disadattamento. Hi everyone, today we have the pleasure to be host in our YouTube channel Lerina Bright. Chief Executive Director of Mission 89, an NGO, so an organization no profit, with which purpose uh, are the following, so research, education, and advocacy. So, uh, Lerina, you start in the world of, uh, of sports, in general sports administration. So I would like to ask you, uh, What kind of Lerina was in the past and now what are your, your goals for Mission 89 in the near future? Well, thank you so much, Tommaso, for inviting me to um, speak uh, on your platform, on the podcast. Um, it's quite an honor and um, it's always a good opportunity for us to educate and to sensitize um Uh, the general public on the subject, which uh, not many people uh, truly understand. And, and there are many passionate uh, sports fans out there. And uh, obviously they, they see the, the wonders and the glories um, that uh, athletes achieve. And um, they're not always aware of the other side, the darker side. And so um, the, the topic that we we work on um, aims to shed light on, on this aspect, uh, which is the protection of minors, um, aspiring athletes in particular from exploitation and trafficking. So in terms of uh, what led me to the space, um, I've always been a very uh, passionate uh, football supporter. Manchester United is, is still um, a, a passion of mine. I'm still struggling with it, but um, It's never uh, well, you know, you know, that's a, a soft spot I have. Yes, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is uh, certainly of the past Man United, but uh, we hope that could also be the, the future still, seeing as uh, he's still playing at such a high level. But um, so football has been a passion of mine. Manchester United was my number one passion in life, actually. So it really was a privilege to be able to work um, in football. And uh, I worked for uh, many years in football administration. I started off at the Irish Football Association, where I launched a domestic club licensing scheme. But then I moved to the Middle East, where I worked uh, at the Bahrain Football Association, and then also uh, was at CONCACAF. So um Football and sport administration has been uh, my life. I played sports uh, as, a, as a young uh, kid. Uh, I played, I was on all the different teams. So I played um, field hockey. I ran cross country. I played rounders, which is a little known sport, netball. And so I always knew that I wanted to, you know, to to go into the sports space. And um, and I had the opportunity to do a, a master's degree in uh, sports administration and technology in Switzerland, uh, the AISDS. And uh, that's where I got started. Yeah. In fact, I would like to ask you if uh, there was a line, so a link between your life experience and the decision to dedicate Uh, to spend your daily life uh, towards minor to protect the minors if there is a connection um, a connection there with is there is because uh, of all the years i spent uh, like working an in like an epiphania <laughs> well the epiphany came when uh, i was seated 
one day looking, I think it must have been the Telegraph or the Guardian, and um, it was certainly an English publication. And there was an article about uh, football trafficking. I was completely knocked off my seat because I thought, how could this be? You know, I mean, I'd been working in the industry for so long and never had any idea that this was going on and um, certainly wouldn't imagine that uh, I was working with traffickers. I still, when I think back, I mean, who could have been, um, you know, any one of the colleagues? No, well, uh, but uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, this happens in the industry and, um, and there are lots of people um, that are in these spaces that are unaware uh, that are going about, you know, recruiting players, thinking that they are, um, you know, thinking that they're bringing, uh, how would I say, they're going to improve the lives of this young talent, their family, you know, um, and uh, they're doing a good thing uh, by taking the, the child, the young child, and bringing them opportunity, and but they don't realize that uh, there are actual national laws and, and international conventions that, uh, you know, uh, prevent one from just uprooting uh, a child, giving them, uh, um, in many cases, a fake birth certificate and a passport uh, to go, you know, try for a career in, in Europe. And so um, the approach that I have always taken uh, because of my background and because I know that I came from the space where even I, as a passionate, you know, sports administrator, fan, you know, I, I believe that there are many uh, well-meaning uh, individuals. There are many that don't mean well, but uh, equally, I believe there are many well-meaning individuals that are going about their work in professional sports in particular, breaking all kinds of um, international convention, uh, international conventions, rules and regulations, because they're not educated on what constitutes human trafficking, or in this case, sports trafficking. They're not sensitized on what the science look like. Um, and so that's the work of Mission 89, uh, which is, you know, to, to educate young people on um, on what a legitimate career in sport looks like and we're not only educating young people but we're also educating coaches you know we're educating government agencies law enforcement um, different stakeholders and uh, because this issue of, of sport trafficking and human trafficking in general is a multi-stakeholder issue and um, you know there's not one single um, individual one single uh, organization, I give the example of FIFA, but it could be FIBA, which is basketball or, um, you know, the baseball, world, baseball, softball confederation, even if they had the, you know, they put in place the, the very best regulations and policies, you know, they are a sports governing body, you know, so they, they, they can certainly do a lot more than they're doing now but they need to work with law enforcement, with civil society organizations, organizations that are on the ground with organizations such as ours, you know, in a cooperative way in order to prevent, in order to protect um, young athletes. So um, I know I didn't quite ask, answer the question, but my epiphany was, you know, I was the telegraph shocked. Article, that... the, telegraph, the Telegraph article. <laughs> yes, sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, 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 so no. I, I was shocked. I, I was shocked that this was happening in the sport that uh, I absolutely love. Um, and um, and so I inter I, I went looking for the survivor, the football trafficking survivor who became a, a Mission 89 ambassador. I went looking for, you know, the documentarist. Uh, I went looking for the person who wrote the article to inquire more about this issue to learn more about this issue. And I, I also spoke with football agents because at that time it appeared as if they were the bad guys. But uh, many years later, I realized that they're only a small piece of the, the problem. And actually many um, agents, uh, you know, are in favor of uh, increased regula in, in increasing uh, regu regulations or having regulations in place. So it's clear. No, it's yes. clear. Thank you for your digression. But in addition to your your point of view, I would like to add uh, what does football trafficking mean 
if you could trace a, a specific perimeter and then okay you could explain to our audience the difference between football trafficking in two sports and through the sports so um i would say that you know the the, the biggest a short, uh, a short out... sentence a short sentence short sentence okay let me try so so generally speaking um when we talk about football trafficking or sport trafficking we're basically talking about an irregular migration process that leads um to human trafficking right and um in the case of um trafficking through sport it's basically when sport is used as a um as a bait basically there's no real opportunity but uh, you know sport is just being used to traffic an individual into some other situation of exploitation so it could be hey you know there's an opportunity for you to join the arsenal academy or um club and um and you you know you get your passport and then eventually you don't even make it to london actually let's say you end up in cape verde or a transit country and uh, or maybe you do make it to london but instead of going to arsenal you you end up um selling drugs you know so you 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 become a drug trafficker or you become a sex worker you become a prostitute you know you're made to to uh, prostitute yourself um so in that case trafficking through sport is when there's no sporting opportunity at all um but sport is just mentioned in order to lure you now trafficking in sport is when there is actually there's a real uh, sporting opportunity but it's exploitative you know meaning that okay there's a club you know in the right now we're talking about players for example that are in a situation in Mongolia that we now that's been brought to our attention so they're in Mongolia there was they're playing for an actual club in Mongolia but they're not um being paid um they're not you know properly housed and uh, perhaps they're ma- being made as well as playing football they're ma- being made perhaps to work in other um areas as well so in trafficking in sports it's the trafficking that's actually happening within the sports industry so there is an opportunity but the the opportunity itself is exploitative at the, the same time uh, what are the instruments taken by fifa in order to fight against this phenomenon in addition to the famous article uh, 19 So article 19 I mean that's uh, as as you mentioned it's it's a article that uh, the provision that's been put in place to protect minors from exploitation it doesn't explicitly mention trafficking but um, you know the the intent is is also you know trafficking is a, is also a form of exploitation you know it's a, it's a it's a good regulation however there's so many gaps um within it that um agents and and traffic traffickers essentially can bypass uh these gaps and they do so you know very very readily um and so while it, it's a good thing um if it's not being monitored or if it's not actually being um how would i say implemented and and uh, somebody is not following through and making sure that it's being Uh, adhered to then it's just uh it's just uh, another regulation so it's well intended it's a good start there are sports that don't even have such a regulation but um i think more definitely needs to be done to uh to to enforce it that's it to enforce it because, because as i said uh... One thing is to enact a law another thing is to enforce enforce the law exactly exactly if you don't have a safeguard or something else mm-hmm. policemen of the fifa dedicated to fifa is difficult to mm-hmm. to keep control on the territory and in general in the various championship um i mean that's that's absolute truth and it's it's uh, it's for football but it's for all sport in general you know uh, i think people need to understand that um same things for olympic games for example well it's so. a, it's the same for olympic games or the international olympic committee and this is by no means when i say it i'm not 
you know, removing responsibility from them because, as I mentioned, there's so much more that they can do. Uh, they can use their platforms to raise awareness, to educate. I mean, uh, now we're working, for example, with the FIFA agents um, uh, division, and uh, we're working to develop a, an ethical recruitment guideline. So they are taking action, you know, but uh, there's always, uh, you know, the, 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 that's the approach that they have taken to addressing this issue, but it's much bigger than that, you know. I think people need to realize the limitations of sport governing bodies. They're more or less um, event organizers, you know. They're they're governing. They govern. Uh, they create rules and regulations for sports. They organize events. That is essentially what a sport governing body does, right? They do not have a law enforcement arm to enforce or to prosecute any criminal. And human trafficking is a criminal activity. So you are actually dealing with criminals. And FIFA does not have, they have security officers, you know, they, they would have a department for security, but they, you know, these, um, you know, nobody within that apartment uh, has the possibility to ar arrest uh, criminals. And so that's where, the cooperation uh, between FIFA and other bodies um, is crucial. So FIFA needs to have on speed dial, uh, ideally, uh, people at Interpol, people at the National Central Bureau of whichever country, for example, they're working in, and they're working in many different countries, but they need to build a network of law enforcement, so have some kind of arrangement with law enforcement where they can share information and allow law enforcement to deal with this criminal activity. At the same time, they need to have relations with organizations such as ours, you know, that can help to facilitate and coordinate along with organizations such as um, the International Organization for Migration. Um, part of their mandate mm -hmm. as a UN agency is to repatriate IOM. IOM. Yeah. Yes, and they're all over the world. So it's important for FIFA, for the Premier League, for football associations. You know, this can happen at a national level. It can happen at an international level. But it's important that they establish those relationships to tackle these issues, these human rights issues, uh, these safeguarding issues, because they do not have the neither the jurisdictional powers or the um, or even the capacities to tackle and to actually undertake some of the actions that are required in relation to prevent yeah in relation to what you said could you provide us some few data or statistics about this phenomenon we know very well that it's very difficult to pick up this data but at the same time it's important for our audience understand mm -hmm. which is the the dimension of uh, this yeah. phenomenon so i know that um, you know we've previously spoken sorry we speak previously spoken about uh, this 15000 figure i know that's where you're going um the reality and people think that it came from us it did not came it did not come from us mm -hmm. uh, it also did not come from dr james essen um yeah. and we we more or less know where it came from now however it's it's the only data that that's around and fully respect it but for us we have always been very hesitant to use that 15000 young you know boys or men from sub saharan africa um end up in western europe you know with that dream of playing football 15000 firstly um 15000 think that number is way below what the reality is just based on the conversations that we've been having. So that's the first. But secondly, we, I wouldn't say question, but um, we're curious about the methodology that was used in order to arrive at that number. And the reason why we have been hesitant is because we believe that in order to, um, to count something, you need to be able to define it and up until now, 
up until Mission 89 in collaboration with Loughborough University and with the support of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association UK, we have now come up with a working definition of sport trafficking. So once we know what the definition of sport trafficking is, once we know what the typologies are, then and only then are we able to start counting. So I think, now that I think, I know that now, we're in a position to begin that process of counting how many victims, you know, there are. Because now that we have the data, the sorry, the, the definition, we have the typologies, we can share, we can share this information with our partners, for example, IOM and the various international agencies. And so when they have their case files, they can look and say, okay, well, this uh we, you know, we thought this was a sex trafficking case or you know a kidnapping case but based on the this definition and based on these typologies we can clearly ascertain that this is a case of sex tra of sports trafficking and and so our next um, goal and purpose uh funding uh permitting is to carry out that quantitative research that is very much needed. We have a talk about uh, prevention. I would ask you, how could you translate prevention in the reality? Which, which are the concrete uh, action for making prevention? If you want to give uh, some suggestion to our audience. Um, so prevention means being educated and uh, being knowledgeable. I mean, one thing, and this is also an internal discussion and something that we've had to evolve with, one thing is to be aware of an issue uh, and another is to be educated on the issue. We do a lot of awareness raising. So we have a Not In Our Game campaign, which we organize uh, with the youth and just to sensitize them on the topic. We give case studies, you know, we uh, also talk about the signs to look out for in terms of fake agents and, and so forth. So that's creating an awareness that this issue exists, right? Education for us is providing, yes, there's an element of sensitization, but uh, having them understand, for example, what, you know, what the core issues are around this topic you know, having them understand what a legitimate pathway for pursuing a career in football looks like. What should they be looking at when they want to seek the services of a football agent, for example? You know, what does ethical recruitment look like from their perspective? How do they involve their parents? You know, and, and so education for young people uh, looks different from education for football agents and capacity building or, you know, education for law enforcement. It looks very different, but uh, there are obviously some fundamentals um, that uh, cross, cut, you know, go across. But uh, that's that's what that's the work that uh, that we do. Because we are not used to to hear from uh, traditional mass media talking about this yeah. topic. So uh, if you want yeah, to... Yeah, so edu education, education is very important, but yeah. also using the platforms. Uh, yes. Could you so, suggest some platform in addition to yours? I would mm. say... Or some documentations. Uh, document, visit our website. We've got lots of, uh, you know, we've got lots of documentation on the issue itself. Uh, broadly speaking about uh, human trafficking, uh, IOM, you know, has uh, a lot of information on their website, a lot of, and we we like working with IOM because uh, they're a very pragmatic organization. So they're very active. And, um, and what that means is if you're a young athlete and well, if you're an athlete, it doesn't matter if you're young, but if you're an athlete and you find yourself in a precarious situation in a foreign country, um, then, you know, uh, look for an IOM office. They're represented pretty much in every single country around the world. As I said earlier, one of their mandates is to help repatriate uh, migrants uh, back to, you know, to their countries. 
And there's also a lot of education on their websites on what a regular migration pathway looks like. You know, so if uh, somebody wants, if a, uh, if a, uh, you know, if an aspiring athlete wants to know exactly how to, you know, undertake a regular migratory pathway, you know, go to the International Organization for Migrations website. You know, there are also services, for example, that they, you know, that they offer migrants because, again, people, a lot of the the footballers, a lot of the athletes start this journey as an irregular migrant and they end up being exploited and they become trafficked victims so um and 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 so that's uh you know there's there's iom there's also unodc uh there are also local you know local organizations on the ground that that help uh then, people then after this overview uh, could you provide us or tell us some direct testimony that you have uh, picked up uh, in your in your experience if you can uh, if you can uh, tell us or if uh, there um, is a secret or privacy i respect in fact uh, the the name is anonymous yes yeah. important at the same time to tell which is the path that these migrants has to come mm -hmm. uh, to come in. Uh, so I mean, there's uh, I think one of the the more I would say um, public cases. Uh, there's our you know there there are the cases that we receive, which uh, I think uh, could be more complex to understand, but more straightforward. Um, and because you can go on and 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 search for it yourself. Uh, would be the case of uh, the athlete, the footballers from Liberia that ended up in Laos. So there were these young uh, footballers and they were recruited. Uh, their agents was uh, a former Liberian national team uh, player. And uh, he, you know, he took them to Laos uh, to play for a football club and they were living the you know, they were living, they, they were all minors, by the way, and they were living in precarious conditions in uh, at the stadium, sleeping on floors, not getting paid as they had been promised, no side co uh, signed contracts, passports taken, and uh, they, they were playing all right, but um, they were also being made to clean and do other, you know, exploitative work. So they had, in effect, been uh, trafficked. And um, and so in that case, uh, FIFA got involved, and uh, uh, you know the case went to CAS, and uh, I invite you all to to um, you know to you can do a search for for Laos uh, trafficking, football trafficking, and uh, the case is is outlined very clearly there. I, I make reference to that particular case because um, it's it's public and um, it will be easier for the public to hopefully remember what I've said and then have something documented because a lot of the cases that we handle are not necessary they don't necessarily end up um you know on the on the internet and does football uh, trafficking also plug uh, women movements and uh, despite uh, different uh, money cash flow uh, or money or cash flow because the, the salary of a women's athlete is different from the salary of a men athletes. And uh, what are the differences between the two phenomena, if there are? Well, I mean, there, there will be, because as you just mentioned, um, you know, for the moment, men are uh, getting paid significantly more uh, than uh, the women footballers. However, women's football is the fastest growing sport in the world. Women's football is becoming um, is is being professionalized at a rapid pace. Investments are coming in, and I do believe that um, that in general, um, investors are probably seeing a greater margin in return. You know, putting in less with the women and, and gaining a lot more, um, and so. For sure, you know, that that is going to grow. And, and what that means is that uh, women will equally face the same risks and the same levels of exploitation that we're seeing in the men's game. 
And uh, if there's something that we all know is that uh, when it comes to taking risks for families, women tend to be more open to taking greater risks in order to, um, you know, in order to to uh, improve the lives of their their families. And so, what we can imagine will happen is that, um, you know, some of the red flags that uh, men might uh you know might look up and say well you know, we don't go there because of xyz um women because again they they they're willing to to do a lot more in order to uh, for the benefit of their family uh, we imagine that they will be taking greater risks and 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 um and obviously that opens them up to uh to uh, significant exploitation regarding false agents how is it possible for this figure to to work uh, um work uh, freely and if uh, this false agents works uh, in collaboration with the criminal organization or not so i mean the the world of uh, football agents even the legitimate ones uh, it's a, it's a, it can be very gray you know so uh there are gray areas even with you know licensed agents and legitimate agents you know let's alone the fake agents um but what i will say is that um now fifa has over the past few years um developed and is working with with uh, very established uh, academic institutions and and uh, practitioners um, also including us I'm not just saying that because but basically what they're doing is that they're educating they're providing a lot of resources to educate their agents their football agents they've now also put in place uh, this licensing scheme which means that um you you know the agents need to go through a formal educational program they then need to pass an exam and from what i understood last year or the year before last uh, the pass rate was 30 percent um which i imagine is uh, significantly lower than when you know some years back i invigilated a uh, uh, football agents uh, exam and I remember going through it and thinking you know this is probably the easiest you know anybody from off the streets could pass this but now it's uh, significantly um, more challenging and so I imagine that um, the the standards you know the standards are growing and um, and the agents are becoming more educated so they in principle should be doing better and in principle uh, I think the next step is for FIFA to educate young people that they should work only with licensed agents or certified agents. And that needs to happen in parallel somehow. But uh, I believe it's going in the right direction. Last few questions. Uh, firstly, um, which is the role of a football club in this network? For example, we know very well that clubs... Uh, uh, Goals is uh, the muscle drain, this uh, concept that try to get out from uh, athletes uh, the best performance yeah. with, and uh, from these, uh, these athletes uh, to earn money in the near future thanks to uh, an hypothetic uh, selling. Uh, so, I mean, the role of the club is um you know to to make sure that they have a strong safeguarding policy to make sure that they have uh um you know a strong modern slavery statement and uh when i talk about policy that they have put in place not only the policies but the mechanisms to protect uh you know young athletes they also need to you know educate their their coaches and and re, and scouts uh, because a lot of the top clubs as you know very well they have satellite you know they have satellite clubs all over the world in Africa and South America and wow. um sometimes they they don't always want to admit this or they don't always you know come to light who these people are and and uh, but I think the club uh, has a strong duty to educate, you know, to to educate uh, these recruiters, 
and then uh, finally, you know, to use their platform. I think this is the easiest and most fundamental way that they can uh, start making a difference is simply by having information on their website as to how it is they conduct their recruitment practices, you know, or their processes, you know, and what it is that, um, what the role of a scout is, what the role of a coach is, what, what, uh, what they can expect, what a young person can expect from a scout and what they should not expect from a real scout. Or And uh, even better is to have uh, a list of the agents that they work with or the scouts that they work with. You know, so because what's happening out there is, uh, you know, you have uh, John Doe appearing in multiple places around the world saying that, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm a scout for Man City. I ask this question because uh, some clubs getting around the rules. So it's important to to, def- to, yeah. outline, to outline with the sharpness, which is the... Now, how clubs are involved in this phenomenon? So uh, it's all about the demand. So in that respect, they're very much involved. You know, they 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 have a there's a very high demand for securing the very best talent that's out there, and they do anything and everything, and they're working around the margin with with margins. Even as I say that they should, you know, that they should. Uh, post what their recruitment process looks like we in football and people that understand it uh, know very well that you know they they are scouts and and other agents that, that are working in the shadows you know that are finding that are looking for video looking through hours and hours of videos and 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 going out in the fields and looking for for that talent. So, I mean, in order to find that one Cristiano or that one Messi, you know, they need to look at hundreds of thousands of um, before they had to fly there. But now they they need to, you know, go through videos. They need to go on. You know, now young people are posting uh, more and more on social media, and so you know, they're driving the demand. And because they're driving the demand, they also need to, there's a huge responsibility there. But somehow the belief is that if they even remotely start talking about this issue, then they are inadvertently admitting or saying that they're involved in it. And, um, And yeah, it's a fact. Some are directly, you know, some are complicit and some are indirectly complicit. You're you're indirectly complicit if you're doing nothing about it. So even if you're not trafficking directly uh, players, indirectly by looking the other way, you are. So um, using their platforms is 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 one sure way of uh, educating, you know, of, of educating the public on on just human trafficking in the community. But also, you know, also uh, the the proper practices that uh, that they follow, and that that the potential players that want to join their club uh, should be aware of. Clear, Lerina, and the last question because we know very well that you are busy. But you know what? Yes, yes. But you mentioned clubs. Uh, I I think um, you know even greater than clubs is is what uh, countries. What can governments do? What can, at a national level, how do you tackle this issue? You know, because if you're the best in anything, you want to go where the best are. And the best uh, talent are in Europe. The best uh, clubs are in Europe at the moment. We're talking about football. And so it's natural that um, it's natural that uh, there's that migration and that desire to move to Europe. But uh, from the conversations that we're having uh, on the ground, it's not every young person, every young talent that actually wants to make the move. It's more more, we're hearing young people that want to stay home. They want to be with their families. They, they like being with their families. But what they want is to have the opportunity to, to earn a decent you know, living playing football in their countries, in their homeland. So at a national level, if governments can invest 
in infrastructure. FIFA can always do more. They do a lot through various programs, but uh, unfortunately, the reality is that these programs are sometimes politicized, you know, the, the monies and all that, but that's something. But if there is an investment in infrastructure, uh, football infrastructure, if there's an investment in football administration where football, um, the football association becomes a, is functioning as a business, the clubs are functioning as businesses, uh, proper marketing departments and marketing uh, specialists and, and so forth, sponsorship, uh, basically commercializing the sport, then, you know, and, and they can pay the, 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 the talent, then more and more young people, you know, I imagine would, would not I imagine uh, as a fact would, would stay. Not everybody wants to earn 15 million a year. You know, some are happy with 50,000. Some might even be able, willing to stay home for 5,000, but um, need to give the, the infrastructure needs to be there uh, to make that uh, a possibility to be even considered. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's a clear, it's a new um, new horizon for younger, youngers, but uh, at the same time, you know very well that business is business. Probably, um, the big fish will eat uh, the small fish <laughs> because uh, you know very well that uh, there are some big clubs, Paris Saint-Germain, Chelsea, Arsenal or Juventus in Italy that uh, took control in the past and now it's uh, difficult to to change the, their mentality. Oh, but but uh, that's that's fine though. I think uh, you know it's, it's like education. The the brilliant minds they want to go to Harvard, they want to go to Oxford, they want to go to the best universities. That should be possible, you know. But there are also good universities in one's country, right? So if you like your home, you get homesick. You're you know that's your personality, but you love whatever subject. You stay home, you go to your university and you make a life. Maybe you don't earn as much as you would reach that level of stardom that you would at Juventus. But um, believe it or not, that's not necessarily everybody's dream. And then maybe maybe Juventus still comes for you at home. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then Juventus comes to you when you're 22 years old, you know, not when you're 14 years old. It's my, my hope for the future. And also yours. Yeah. So the last question uh, was related to: uh, Do you have, if you have some uh, new projects in works uh, in the near future? Near future. Thanks to, uh, thanks yes, to so, uh, Mission Eighty Nine. Um. So we have just uh, concluded that the first ever global thematic report on sport trafficking, as I mentioned. And um, yes, it's the first of its kind. But uh, we would very much like to. Uh, already think of the the next phase, which is to again start um, mapping the numbers and 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 uh, you know how many people, etc. Which is what which is what uh, <clears throat> most people want to know, and um, and so uh, research is always very important because it drives advocacy, it drives uh, regulations, policy, etc. Um, and then, of course, we, you know, we want to continue our education of young people um, around the world through our Not In Our Game campaign. And so if there's one thing, if there's one clear way to to be active and to make a difference is certainly to um, is to uh, contribute to this uh, effort, which is to which is a, a youth forum, basically, that um, uh, you've spoken to Daniele. He is a. Uh, you know he yeah. is the, the front man for for that campaign and um we have we've been organizing it all across uh, the world and and um and it's educating it's raising awareness but it's also educating young people on what again um you know a legitimate pathway looks like and now we're not only talking about uh you know yes of course we have to inform them about the risks we need to inform them about the regulations you know because you will not imagine how many young people don't know that they don't know article 19 and don't know that you are not allowed to move from one country to another 
if you're not 18 years old. You should see the light bulb moment when we inform them that most young people don't realize that. So once they they so that education or that awareness obviously will allow them, you know, if if an agent approaches them and at 14 and starts selling and they know this, they that's already a red flag. And so we have this uh, not in our game campaign which uh, provides them with all this information. But we now also have started inviting um, sports football professionals. And when I mean football professionals, I don't mean uh, footballers. I mean uh, people from the industry. So it's important to also make young people aware that even if they cannot play football, you know, there's an entire industry, you know. So we invite football uh, sports lawyers to talk about their work. We invite uh, football agents to talk about their work. We invite coaches to talk about their work so that, you know, young people can know that you can go, you can, if you go to your football association, they can tell you how to get your badges, your coaching badges. So if you stop playing at 18, of course, you need to ideally go to university, but alongside that, you can be working to get your coaching badges. So, you know, even a nutritionist, a sports nutritionist, you know, there's so many people and so many professionals that make Cristiano great, <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. um, and so the, the possibility is, is yes, um, you know, only a 0.0% will become Cristiano, nice. 0.000, you know, but in the, but in the events that you don't, it's still possible for you to work within the industry. And so we expose young people to these different careers um, in football and in sports, yes. I would like to stay to talking with you for hours, but uh, I believe that it's enough because uh, thank you for your time. You are very Thank busy. you, Tommaso. I hope that in the future, this okay. kind of uh, collaboration and testimonies would be go on. So... Now it's time to to say goodbye and uh, have a nice yes. evening. Last so sentence. Dinner Come time. On. Come on, Manchester United. Uh-huh. Come on, Manchester United. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if if that's a good way to to end the conversation. That's <laughs> only one additional stress to the day. But we're hope we're hopeful that um, that uh, things will improve at the club. When Sir Alex left, the yes. disaster. Yes. Well, actually, I believe that it's when David Gill, the CEO, left. What yeah. you know, the year before that, that's when everything started to. But probably they had, uh, you know, they had uh, Sir Alex saw what was happening to the club before we saw it, and he he left at the top, and so I think that's a lesson to everybody, which is leave at the top and don't wait you know and maybe that's also a message to the person that's there right now i mean of course he hasn't ever gone to the top but maybe it's important <laughs> that uh, he leaves before the club completely crashes which is yeah tough days at uh, man united but hey one we day, will get better one day you will come back with the red Evans. thank you very much sir. Thank you, Tommaso. Se avete gradito la tipologia di contenuto su un aspetto sportivo, economico e sociale che oggigiorno affligge il nostro calcio, siete pregati di lasciare un like e di iscrivervi al canale. Inoltre, qualora voleste consigliarci altri ospiti esperti in materia, siamo ben accetti di accogliere le vostre proposte.